గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ పార్టిసిపెంట్స్ ఐ హోప్ యూఆర్ ఆల్ ఎబుల్ టు హియర్ మీ అండ్ సీ మీ ఇఫ్ ఎనీ వన్ హ్యాస్ ఆడియో వీడియో ప్రాబ్లమ్ ప్లీజ్ పాయింట్ అవుట్ బిఫోర్ ద స్టార్ట్ టు ద సెషన్ Apparently, you don't have any problem, audio or video problem, so you can start to discussion. So, we now look at the second case study for resolution model and effect on resolution on the financial statement. So, we have done one case study in yesterday's session, last session. So, today we will do the second case study. The case study is on your screen. anybody else have audio problems only one one participant is reporting audio problems so i just wanted to ask if anybody else have audio problems problem in hearing me so apparently other don't have audio problems so uh, Devale Manish, I will request you to log out and log in again and see that the problem goes away. Problem goes away. Problem could be at your end. So please log out and log in again. So the case study, let's look at the case study. The company revalued its land and buildings at the start of the year to 10 million, out of which 4 million was for the land. So, 6 million for the building, 4 million for the land. The property cost 5 million, 10 years prior to revaluation. At that time, the land was 1 million, the building was 4 million. The total expected useful life of 50 years is unchanged. The company's policy is to make an annual transfer of realized amounts to return the earnings. So, to show the effects on the financial statements for the year, in which revolution was done. So, the property has been depreciated based on its... See, land is... Like for land, there is no depreciation. So, the building... Building was getting depreciated for the last 10 years. The building which cost $4 million was being depreciated over 10 years with a useful life of 50 years. So 10 by 50, that is one fifth of the building has already been depreciated. So the carrying value, the carrying value of the property is one fifth of 4 million has been depreciated, that means 80,000 has been depreciated. So the building's carrying value was 3 million, 3.2 million, land was 1 million, so carrying value was 4.2 million after the position of 10 years. Is that clear? See, originally the building cost 4 million, it had a useful life of 50 years. It has been depreciated for the last 10 years. So one fifth of the building, 10 by 50. 50 is the total useful life, 10 years have already passed. So one fifth of the building's original value has been depreciated, which is 80,000. So the carrying value of the building is 3.2 million. The land is not depreciated, so the carrying value of the property is 4.2 million. Now the property is revalued to 10 million. So revaluation and reserve will be the carrying value of the property will now become 10 million and the balance 10 million minus 4.2 million will be carried to the revolution reserve. And now in the year of revolution, 
the remaining life of the building is 40 years. The carrying value of the building is 6 million. So 6 million has to be depreciated over 4 years. Yes, 6 million by 40. So 150,000 will be 150,000 will be the annual depreciation. Earlier the depreciation was 18,000. So the excess depreciation is 70,000. The additional depreciation to be charged each year is 70,000. Okay. So let's look at the solution. These are some of the numbers I just wanted to tell you before we go to the solution. The solution will be on your screen. So depreciation will be 150,000. Revolution given is 5.8 million, 10 million minus 4.2, 5.8 million. So in the statement of financial position, land and building will be shown at 10 million minus depreciation for the year 9850. The carrying value of the property is 10 million, it is depreciated. The annual depreciation will be 150,000. So the carrying value or land and building will be shown in the balance sheet at 9850 after depreciation for that year. Revaluation reserve, the excess of the depreciation after revaluation over the earlier depreciation, that is 150,000 minus 80,000, 70,000 will be transferred from revaluation reserve to the retained earnings. So 5800 was the revaluation reserve. So 70,000 gets transferred to the retained earnings. So the revaluation reserve becomes 5730 at the end of the year. In the statement of changes in equity extract, revaluation gain will be 5.8 million and from that 70,000 will be transferred to retained earnings, so 5730 or 5.730 million will be the revolution reserve at the end of the year. So these are the workings basically. Anything not clear? <coughs> Please tell me. Note down a few points before evaluation. Original cost of land one million. Original cost of <coughs> building. million. So only the building will be depreciated, not the land. Depreciation over useful life is 50 years. So annual depreciation before evaluation was 4 million by 50, so it is 80,000. This is before evaluation. So for 10 years, accumulated depreciation for 10 years, 800,000. 10 into 3,000. So carrying value
of building after 10 years first 10 years is 4 million minus 800,000 so that is 3.2 million These are the numbers you have to remember. <coughs> now when the build, when the property was revalued, it was revalued at 10 million. 4 million for the land, 6 million for the building. The useful life estimate is unchanged. So the building has 40 years of remaining useful life. So that 6 million, the revalued amount of the asset has to be depreciated over 40 years. So the annual depreciation will be now 150,000 instead of 80,000. So when we revalue the asset, the difference between the carrying value and the revalued amount will be transferred to revaluation reserve or revaluation gain account. So when the property is revalued at that point of time, the carrying value of the uh, land and building is 4.2 million and the revalued amount is 10 million. So difference 5.8 million will be transferred to revaluation reserve. And the land and building will be shown now in the balance sheet up to 10 million. In the year of revaluation, 150,000 will be the deposition charge on the building. So the carrying value will come down after charging the position of 150,000 in the year when revaluation was done. The carrying value of the property, uh, property will come down from 10 million to 8.5 million. So at the end of the year, the carrying value of the building will be shown at 8.5 million. Uh, 9.85 million, sorry, not, not 8.5, 10 million minus 150,000 is 9.85 million. Now, the excess of the revaluation for the revalued asset over the earlier revaluation, historical revaluation or the revaluation based on the historical cost, that difference will be adjusted each year, will be transferred each year from the revaluation reserve to the retained earnings account. The difference is 150,000 minus 80,000, 70,000. So 70,000 will be transferred from revaluation reserve of 5.8 million. So the revaluation reserve will become 5.73 million and 70,000 will get transferred to the retained earnings account. Is that clear to everyone? Yes, 32. Any question you can ask at this point of time, anything not clear to you, please ask it. Don't keep the question to yourself. Then, then next thing we talk about derecognition of PPE. A property, plant and equipment when it is derecognized. That means it will be removed from the financial statements. So when the fixed assets get derecognized? One is on disposal, that means the fixed asset is sold. It can result in gain or loss. When you are selling a fixed asset, you can have a gain because you can sell it for a higher amount than the carrying amount in the, in the financial statement, then it is a gain. If you are selling it for a lower amount than the carrying amount of that PP in your financial statement, then it is a loss. Or the recognition of PP can take place when no future economic benefits are expected. Although it is not so that no future benefit econ future economic benefits are expected from that asset. So gain or loss is basically net disposal profits minus carrying amount. That is the point of time when a PP will be recognized from the financial statement that that means that particular item of the property, plant and equipment will no more be shown in the financial statement. That is what is meant by digital So it can happen on disposal of the asset 
or when no future economic benefits are expected from the use of the asset. Now you have a small quiz, very small quiz. Can the depreciation amount method be reviewed? And if yes, who is accounting treatment done? Now I am waiting for a response on this. Can the depreciation method be reviewed? And if yes, how is accounting treatment done? For no response coming, coming up from your side. No response from your side, still now. Something is coming up. Okay, Digba Agarwal comes up with a response. Thank you, Digba. Yes, it can be reviewed at the end of each financial year. In fact, what Digba says is correct. I will put it a little, I will make it a little stronger. I mean, it should be reviewed. Not only it can be reviewed, it should be reviewed at least at each financial year end. The management should review the deposition method at least at each financial year end and if there is a significant change in the expected pattern of economic benefits from those assets, the method should be changed to suit the change pattern. Okay. <coughs> the specific account debit to asset account credit what Devale Manish is telling is a direct method. That is what we discussed about direct method and indirect method. In direct method, you debit depreciation account and credit the corresponding asset account. Indirect method, you debit depreciation account and credit accumulated depreciation account. So you maintain a separate account called accumulated depreciation account. That is called indirect method. Actually, most businesses they follow the indirect method. Direct method will be debiting depreciation account and creating the asset account. <coughs> so directly you are creating the asset account. In, in, but most of the businesses, what they do, they debit depreciation account and credit the accumulated depreciation account. So this is a, uh, this is a response to the various comments. Okay. So what does the accounting treatment done when a depreciation is reviewed? Supposing method is reviewed, the accounting treatment, the change in method should be accounted for as a change in accounting estimate. So if there is a change in depreciation method, it should be treated as a change in accounting estimate and the depreciation charge for the current year and future periods only should be adjusted. There will be no retrospective adjustment. For changes in accounting estimate, there cannot be any retrospective adjustment. So the earlier years profit and loss balance sheet will not be affected. Only the current years and the future years financial statements may get affected due to changes in the depreciation. So it is a prospective effect. Any change in accounting estimate only has a prospective effect, not a retrospective effect. So that is to be understood because changes in method of depreciation is treated as a change in accounting estimate. And it has only a prospective effect, so it can affect only the current year's profit and future year's profits, but not past year's profits. So we will talk about some differences between IFRS and US gap in the matter of property plant and equipment. <coughs> so one area is the revolution model. Under IFRS a historical cost is primary for accounting. But IFRS also permits the revolution to the fair value of the property plant and equipment option between the so there's the option between the cost model and revolution model for each class of asset. So under IFRS, there is an option 
the entity, business entity can adopt either the revolution model or the cost model for a particular class of asset. But if it is applied, if the revolution model is applied to one item of a particular class of asset, all the other items in the same class of asset should be also, uh, revolution model should also be followed. You cannot <coughs> use cost model for one building and revolution model for another building. So if the company has two properties, land and building, they cannot apply cost model for one property and the revolution model for the other property. So company has an option to choose the cost model or the revolution model, but once they adopt one of these two models, that should apply to each <coughs> item of fixed assets in a particular asset class. Under US GAAP, generally utilizes the historical cost and prohibits the revaluation of PPE. So US GAAP follows only the historical cost or cost model and they prohibit the revaluation PP, but only cost model is applicable. So there is no revaluation model under US GAAP. <coughs> Secondly, regarding depreciation, IFRS requests that for separate and significant components of PPE, different economic life be recorded and accordingly depreciation be made. So for separate and significant components of PPE, PPE can have different components like building, can be plant and machinery. For each separate and significant component of PPE, different economic life should be recorded and depreciation will be done. But US GAAP doesn't require component componentation approach for depreciation. So these are the two points of difference between IFRS and US GAAP so far depreciation of property, plant and equipment or is concerned or accounting for property, plant and equipment is concerned. Any questions? Otherwise today we'll uh, move to intangible assets. So far we have been talking about fixed assets of property, plant and equipment. Today we will be discussing somewhat similar thing which is called intangible assets. The concepts, some of the concepts may be very similar for intangible assets. Accounting concepts or treatments. talk about the definition, recognition, measurements and disclosure requirements for intangible assets as per IS 38. So we are talking about accounting standard 38 that we are going to discuss. We will also talk about under, try to understand the treatment of research and development cost under the provisions of IS 38 and try to understand the difference difference between the provisions of PS gap and IF, IFRS so far as intangible assets are concerned. So IS 38 is the guiding accounting standard. It prescribes the recognition and measurement criteria for intangible assets that are not covered by other standards. Those intangible assets which are not covered by other standards are basically the recognition and measurement of those assets are covered under IS 38. The standard will enable users of financial statements to understand the extent of an entity's investment in such assets and the movements therein. The principal issues involved here related to the nature and recognition of intangible assets number one. So we talk about the nature of intangible assets, the recognition, determining the cost <coughs> and assessing the amortization and impairment losses that need to be recognized. 
the standard does apply to expend the standard basically <coughs> may apply to expenditures such as advertising training startup costs research and development patents licensing motion picture film software technical knowledge franchises customer loyalty market share market knowledge etc but it doesn't apply to financial assets which are defined in is 39 which we will be discussing subsequently financial instruments so assets which are covered under is 39 called financial assets is 38 doesn't apply to this these are not in those are not intangible assets they are called financial instruments it doesn't apply to mineral rights and expenditure on the exploration for and development and extraction of mineral oil natural gas and similar non regenerative resources it doesn't apply to deferred tax assets which is covered under is 22 or leases which are covered under is 17 which will be discussing separately or intangible assets held for sale in the ordinary course of business that is covered under is 2 so what are intangible assets let's first try to nature a definition of intangible assets let's try to understand an identifiable and identifiable non monetary asset it must be a non monetary asset an identifiable non monetary asset without physical substance which has no physical substance that means no physical form etc Held for use in production or supply of goods and services is an intangible asset. So it must be identifiable. One criteria is identifiable. It must be non-monetary, and it must be without physical substance. And it is held for use in production or supply of goods and services that is called intangible asset. So properties of intangible assets are number one, identifiable. Number two, it must be non-monetary. number 3 it must be without physical substance and lastly it is held for production or supply of goods or services all four of this criteria must be met to determine whether an asset is intangible asset or not all these four criteria have to be fulfilled for an asset to be classified as intangible it should also fulfill the definition of the asset what is the definition of the asset asset is a resource let's go back to the origin definition of the asset which i have discussed earlier asset is nothing but a resource controlled by an entity as a result of past events it's a resource controlled by an entity arising from past events as a result of past events and from which future economic benefits are expected to flow to the entity So, asset is something which is controlled by an entity. It's a resource controlled by an entity. As a result of past events, maybe the entity purchased it at some point of time, and from which future economic benefits are expected to flow to the entity. That is what is an asset. So, everything in so intangible asset also must fulfill this definition of the asset. So, resource. which is controlled by an entity as a result of past events and from which future economic benefits are expected to flow to the entity will be considered as intangible if it is identifiable if it is a non monetary asset if it is without physical substance and it is held for production or supply of goods or services the examples of possible intangible assets will look at some examples of possible intangible assets this list is only illustrative not exhaustive there can be many more types of different intangible assets so let's look at some of the examples identifiable means you can identify it something which you can identify separately that is identifiable if if that resource is not identifiable then it is not a, it is intangible asset it must be identified this particular thing that should be. <coughs> but whatever can be identified is identifiable <coughs> this is in response to hemant's question whatever can be identified is identifiable 
So examples of possible intangible assets are computer software. <coughs> so when, when an entity purchases a computer software, develops a computer software for their own use, like Kali, many business entities they buy Kali. It's a computer software that they are purchasing, it's an intangible asset. Patents. Patents for production of goods, medicines, or other other kind of things. <coughs> Copyrights. Motion picture film. Licenses. Import quotas. Franchises. Marketing rights. These are various kind various examples of intangible assets. But again I to tell you this list is not a complete list, it's not an exhaustive list. There are other intangible assets which other examples can be given. This is only for the purpose of illustration. Just to show you what are the to make you familiar with the various intangible assets. Now how the methods of acquiring these intangible assets could be different either by separate purchase or by exchange of assets, an entity may buy an intangible asset by exchanging with some other asset. As a part of a business combination, when an entity acquires another entity. Business combination means when an entity acquires or takes over another entity. So as a part of a business combination, it can be acquired by a government grant or it can be self-generated by internal generation like a company. A software company makes a software for their own use. It's an internally generated intangible asset. It is a suggestive list only, there could be many other. But whatever is the mode of acquisition, whether it is by separate purchase or by exchange of assets or acquired as a part of a business combination or it, it is acquired by a government grant or it is acquired through self-creation, it must meet the definition and recognition criteria. Definition we have already discussed, then we will come to the recognition criteria. When can an intangible asset be recognized in the financial statement? That will come to. Definition we have already covered in the last slide. So recognition of intangible assets by IS 38, the critical attributes of intangible assets are number one, somebody is asking identifiable. One is the identifiability. An intangible asset is identifiable when it is separable, number one, and arises from contractual or other legal rights. It can be separable so you can <coughs> separate it from other assets, number one. And secondly, it arises from contractual or other legal rights. <coughs> so an asset meets the identifiable criterion which is capable of being separated from the entity and sold and transferred, licensed or rented either individually or in combination with the related contract, asset or liability. That is the meaning of separable. We can separate it from the entity and it, it is possible to sell it, transfer it, license it or rent it either individually or in combination with a related contract, asset or liability. That is the test for identifiability and secondly, that is number one. And secondly, it arises from a contractual or other legal rights regardless of whether those rights are transferable or separable from the entity or other rights or obligations. That is that test for identifiability. So one thing is separable and it arises from contractual or other legal rights. Number two critical attribute of intangible assets are control. So an entity controls an asset if it has power. When, it's, when we say con entity has power is controlling a particular asset. When it has the power to obtain future economic benefits flowing from the underlying resource, number one, and it can restrict the access of others to those benefits. Two things must happen. One is the entity must have the power to obtain future economic benefits flowing from the underlying resource, number one. And number two, it must, it also can restrict the use access of others to those benefits. 
then you say it as a control. And future recurring benefits basically may include revenue from the sale of products, services or process. That is one, 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 one example of future recurring benefit. It can be also cost savings. It can be also other benefits from use of an asset. So these are the three criteria, critical things, critical attributes of an intangible asset. One is the identifiability, that means it's separable and it is arises from contractual obligations or contractual or other legal rights. This is one. Second is control, the entity must control that asset. So it has the power to obtain the future economic benefits flowing from that underlying resource of the asset and it can restrict the access of others to those benefits. If it has powers to obtain future economic benefits but cannot restrict the access of others to those benefits then it is not having control over that asset. Control needs to be looked at carefully. An entity may be able to identify skills in its workforce and to measure the cost of providing those skills to its staff. So an entity may find that a certain skills can be given to his staff, the employees can be trained Certain skills are needed for the business, and, and, and employees can, can all, uh, certain employees can be trained in that skill. The problem is the entity may not have control over the expected economic benefits arising from the skill staff, as they can leave their employment. So, entity can obtain future economic benefits by providing training to the staff and get them trained in a particular skill. But entity, the benefits, entity doesn't have control because the staff can do the employment. So it can restrict others to access the use of that. So some other organization may, the, the, employee, the skilled employee may live for another organization. So when he goes to another organization, the other organization will be deriving those economic benefits from his skill. So the entity has no control over the Start. Yes, as long as the skilled employee is working for the employee, the future economic benefits can be obtained by the, by, the, by the employer. But once the skilled employee leaves for another organization, goes to another organization, then the other organization will be benefiting from that skill. So entity really has, doesn't have a control over its skill staff. So skill staff or knowledge available with the skilled members of staff cannot be considered as a Intangible asset. So the point of control should be very clearly understood. Similarly, purchase of customer list or expenditure advertising. Sometimes certain organizations they purchase list of prospective customers or they make huge expenditure advertising. This expenditure is identifiable, etc., but they do not provide control to an entity over the expected future benefits. Because customers are not forced to buy the entity and they can go. So if you are advertising, maybe you are advertising your product, but your advertisement expenditure may not restrict the customer to whom it is targeted to buy from you. They can buy from others. So that is, that is the, the control is not there. So when the advertising expenditure is not okay, <laughs> you are creating possibly, you <coughs> are going to get a number of customers in future, fine, there will be future economic benefits, but you do not have control really speaking, because the advertisement may, <coughs> because of the advertisement, some, some of them will come to you to buy their goods, but some of them can go to your computers to buy their goods, similar goods. So you have really no, you cannot restrict others access to those benefits. So your computer also get benefits. And future economic benefits should flow to the entity. This may include revenue from the sale of products, services or processes, but also includes cost savings or other benefits from use of an asset. 
like use of an intellectual property can reduce operating cost rather than produce revenue. So that is also economic benefit. <coughs> an item of intangible asset may be recognized, an item may be recognized as an intangible asset only recognition criteria, only if it meets the definition of an intangible asset which we discussed earlier. Number two, it is probable that the expected future economic benefits that are attributable to the asset will flow to the entity. And lastly, very important, the cost of an asset can be measured reliably. So three things, three, three things must be, three conditions must be fulfilled for recognition of an item as an intangible asset in your financial statements. Number one, it must meet the definition of an intangible asset, which we discussed earlier. Number two, it is probable that the expected future economic benefits that are attributable to the asset will flow to the entity. And number three, the cost of an asset can be measured reliably. So the definition of the intangible asset must be met, future economic benefits should be probable, and cost can be measured reliably. Then only it will be recognized as an intangible asset in the financial statement of the or books of the entity. If the asset doesn't generate future economic benefits, then it cannot be recognized. Although it meets the definition of intangible asset, but if it doesn't generate future economic benefits, it cannot be treated as an intangible asset. Like internally generated goodwill. There are many companies who are very well known. Very well known companies. So a lot of goodwill has been generated. They are very good names in the market. But these are all internally generated goodwill. It cannot be treated as an intangible asset because internally generated goodwill, the cost cannot be reliably measured. Can you reliably measure the cost of internally generated goodwill? Goodwill is created over a period of time. The company's goodwill has been created over a period of time. And the cost thereof cannot be measured reliably. Hence, internal generated goodwill is not recognized as an intangible asset. Only when goodwill is acquired, mainly through a business combination when you purchase another company, when one company purchases another company, goodwill may be acquired, that is purchased. That goodwill can only be recognized as an intangible asset. But internally generated goodwill can never be recognized as an intangible asset because its cost cannot be reliably measured. But when you are buying another company, the cost of the goodwill can be measured. So then it can be recognized as an intangible asset. This requirement must be applied, the requirement regarding recognition of intangible asset. This must be applied to whether an intangible asset is acquired externally or generated internally. Whether, as long as the cost can be reliably measured, even if it is generated internally, no problem. As long as it meets the definition of an intangible asset, as long as it provides future economic benefits, or it is probable that future economic benefit may flow to the entity, and thirdly, as long as the cost can be reliably measured, whether internally generated or externally gener acquired, intangible asset can be recognized in the financial statement. If intangible assets do not meet both the definition of an intangible asset and the criteria for recognition as an intangible asset, IS 38 will require the expenditure on this item to be recognized as an expense when it is incurred. If, it doesn't if the asset doesn't meet the definition of an intangible asset, and the criteria for recognition as an intangible asset is also not fulfilled. The IS 38 requires the expenditure on that particular item to be recognized as an expense when it is incurred to profit and loss account. So it will treat as an expense. In some cases, an intangible asset may be contained or in a tangible item. Obvious examples are computer software. Computer software is contained in something. It is never, computer software is normally 
when you buy a computer the software is loaded in the computer you can buy other software and you can load it in the computer so basically here the intangible asset may be contained in a tangible item like a like knowledge in a book you are buying book the whatever is written in the book or the knowledge contained in the book is contained in the paper it is printed on the paper which second point tell me the point once more which second point you are talking about Jarvale Manish, please tell me which point. And the cost is not generated internally. In Supposing a company is developing a software. For its own use, is it internally generated, or externally acquired? Hemant Singh, this is the answer to Hemant Singh. If a company, software company, develops a software for their own use, let's say, will you consider the software to be externally acquired or internally generated? They can buy a software from the market, or they can buy, they can develop their own software. So it is generated internally, and it, it may be possible also to measure the cost. If it is possible to measure the cost of gen developing the software which is internally generated, then that may be treated as an intangible asset. It can be recognized as an intangible asset. Develop money, what is the point? Oh, intangible assets do not meet the definition. Definition we have seen. So some asset is not. Meetings, the some asset appears to be intangible otherwise. So intangible assets do not meet the definition like advertisement expenditure. It may apparently meet the definition of intangible asset, but it doesn't, may not meet the criteria for recognition as an intangible asset. Okay. So this will be expense. It's, if there is some item which is not either the, are not not meeting the definition of an intangible asset, truly speaking. And secondly, like advertising expenditure, you have no control there. Apparently, advertising expenditure, everything is there. It it, it meets the definition, but basically, lack of control. You don't have control over that resource. That's why it is not meeting the definition of intangible asset. And the criteria for recognition as an intangible asset, if it doesn't meet, then. The IS 38 will require that expenditure on this item to be recognized as an expense when it is incurred. If something, if there is some item which is not meeting the definition of intangible assets, nor it is meeting the criteria for recognition of an intangible asset, then IS 38 requires that it should be treated as an expenditure. That's all. It should be treated as an asset. It should be treated as an expenditure for the purpose of determining profit and loss. Now, coming back to the point I was taking, making, sometimes an intangible asset may be contained on or in a tangible item. Like I am giving example of software. Software is contained in, loaded in your computer or in your cell phone. Right? Similarly, knowledge. Knowledge is, knowledge contained in a book. It may be printed on a book. The book is a tangible item. It is printed on paper. Paper is a tangible item, but it is correct. But the knowledge is the intangible part of it. It is contained in the, the particular book or this thing. Okay. So these are basically in such a situation where the intangible asset may be contained or in a tangible item, contained on or in a tangible item. In such a situation, judgment is required to determine which is the most significant element. Of the two, which is the most significant element? Now, like in the case of a machine incorporating a software that cannot be operated without the software. There is a machine or a computer, like a computer. Can your computer be operated without the operating system? Can your cell phone operate without the Android? operating system. So sometimes 
that in the situation a machine incorporating a software that cannot be operated without the software, like operating system like Windows, Linux, or Android software refers for your smartphone. In that case, when the software, the particular software without which the machine will not will be operated, then it will be the entire item will be treated as a property plant and equipment under IS 16. So when you buy a computer which comes with an operating software, that computer will be treated as a property as an item of property plant and equipment. Although the software is contained in that, the software will not be treated separately or recognized separately as an intangible asset. The entire thing, that means the computer which is loaded with the operating soft, uh, system will be treated as a property plant and equipment. Similarly, when you buy a book which contains certain knowledge and the knowledge is in the form of printed letters on the page of the book, then <coughs> basically you will consider what? That is an intangible asset or tangible asset. So judgment is required. So what is it? How will you treat it? Is it property plant and equipment when you buy a book or you will treat it as an intangible asset? Which is more important? You bought the book not for the papers but for the knowledge contained in that book. So since the knowledge contained in the book is the more dominant or more important thing here, so we treat the book as an intangible asset, not as a property plant and equipment. That's the difference. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> but adding software on a computer, such as you buy some report writing software or enterprise resource <coughs> Supposing you have purchased a computer and after buying the computer you are buying some other I still have not checked the cycle test to date, I cannot tell you at this moment, it is not possible to check that date. But you, have, you can ask your batchmates, they will be knowing the dates. Okay. So I cannot answer you right now, should be seen. I am trying to get your schedule, but schedule is not yet ready. <coughs> Somebody says 14th April, so this week. Ramon Singh tells 14th April, I think that is correct. So, Sadhguru, you can take the data as 14th April. <coughs> so, next, I think it's Friday. Okay. <coughs> now, let's go, go back to that example. So, when you buy a computer software which is coming, uh, come, sorry, computer with a uh, coming with a uh, operating system, the entire computer with that operating system will be considered as a property plant and equipment. But when you buy a book with, with a subject or a particular subject, so you are trying to get a knowledge on the subject, you are buying the book for the knowledge, not for the papers. So the book will be considered as an intangible asset. Okay. <clears throat> but supposing you are buying another software in that, in your computer you are loading another software like a report writing software or accounting software like Tally, etc. or antivirus software, this is not required for operating the tangible asset and therefore will be accounted under IS-38 as intangible asset. So please understand the differences. When I buy a computer which comes with an operating system and without the operating system the computer cannot even function, then the computer, the hardware along with the software will be treated as a property plant and equipment under IS-16. But when I buy a tally for using that computer, tally accounting software, or some other software I, I buy for operating using that computer, load it in the computer, that will be treated under IS-38 as an intangible asset. So let's uh, have a small quiz here. Try to identify the intangible assets and give reasons. Like operating system on a newly purchased computer system. Is there an intangible asset here or not? So we try to identify whether it is an intangible asset or not. So operating system on a newly purchased computer system, is it an intangible asset or not? Yes, just now we are discussing these things. 
So exercise is to identify the intangible assets and give reasons. So operating system is a newly purchased software. This is not an intangible asset because operating system is treated as an integral part of the computer system itself. This is an integral part of the entire computer system. So entire computer system is treated under IS 16. But knowledge contained in a book, in the printed copy of a published book is an intangible asset because knowledge contained in the book is more significant than the tangible medium that is book, that is paper, and brings value to the medium. See, the book book has a value because of the knowledge contained in it, not because it is, it is, you look at the value of the paper with which the book, the book is made, and the value of the book, price of the book, there is a huge difference. Paper may cost you some, maybe, <coughs> some 20, 30 rupees, but the book may cost you 300 rupees, because of the knowledge contained in it. So the significant element here is the knowledge contained in the book, not the tangible medium. Therefore, the knowledge contained in the printed copy of a published book is an intangible asset. ERP package installed in a server, this is an add-on software, add software. Because a server can operate without the ERP package. This is something, an additional software we are loading for our use. So it's an additional software installed which has been purchased or developed. It is identifiable and separate from the hardware and its own individual value which can be cost can be reliably measured. So entity controls the software acquired under on hence it's a separate intangible asset under IS thirty eight. Know how with the key resource or staff of a premier consulting company. Now in a premier consulting company there are employees who have a lot of Valuable know-how. The know-how is the key resources for staff of a premier consulting company cannot be treated as an intangible asset simply for the reason that entity doesn't have a control. Know-how means knowledge. Know-how means knowledge. Okay. So know-how is the key resources for staff of a premier consulting company. Okay. Now, the entity really has no control over that, that particular resource because the employee may leave this company and go to another company. So the economic benefits that flow from that know-how available with a key resource or staff of a premier consulting company, the entity doesn't have a control over that. So for lack of control, so one of the attributes of intangible assets you have dis dis discussed is control. So control aspect is missing here because the employee at any point of time go and join another consulting company. So the benefits of the know-how will now be derived by the other company which he joins. So this is not an intangible asset. Manchester United has acquired services of Lionel Messi in contract of 20 million dollars restricting the player not to play with any other club. Here there is a control because Lionel Messi cannot play with any other club during this period of contract. So the benefits which will come from a player like Lionel Messi will be available only to the Manchester United. So there is a control, so this is an intangible asset. ABC Inc. has signed Vishwanathan Anand for advertisements to be displayed for 5 years, making payment for an amount of 2 million. Here again it is not an intangible asset because advertisement expenditure, again when you make an expenditure in advertisement, the benefits, you do not have control over the benefits. So advertisement expenditure doesn't, cannot be considered as an intangible asset. It is normally treated as a deferred revenue expenditure. And number seven point is, heavy expenditure incurred by Flipkart and conducting market research for a new product line. Again, this is not an intangible asset because research cost, we will discuss about research cost, it is always expense in the year it is incurred and not it is an intangible asset. We will talk about research and development cost. Research cost is not an intangible asset. It has to be expense in the year it is incurred and not treated as an intangible asset. Okay. 
so that we will discuss when you go to research and development course. So we will have a short break at this point of time and then we will continue.
Well, we'll come back after the break. The recognition of intangible asset. How it is recognized in the financial statement or in the books of accounts. If it is purchased separately, then it will be recognized at the cost. If the intangible asset is purchased separately, like the company buys a software. So whatever is the cost of the software to be paid to the company which sold the software, that will be recognized as a as the cost of that intangible asset. If it is purchased as a part of the business combination, that means when a company acquires another business, then the fair value, if it can be reliably measured, fair value of that goodwill, if it can be reliably measured, then that reliable measurement will be the amount recognized in the books of accounts as the cost of that intangible asset. If it is internally generated, then only the, only the development cost, research and development cost relating to that generated internally, internally generated intangible asset will be recognized. So, if the asset is purchased separately, recognize it at cost. If it is purchased as a part of a business combination, recognize at fair value like good goodwill and business acquisition. So basically the fair value will be fair value of the consideration paid to acquire the business minus fair value of the net assets of the business are acquired. And lastly, if it is internally generated, research and development cost, but this will discuss separately. So first we'll talk about separately purchased intangible assets. In, intangible assets which are purchased separately. These are recorded at cost. It will include all costs necessary to make the intangible assets ready for their intended use. So whatever, whatever actually applies for property, plant and equipment also applies here. It will be recorded at cost and include all costs which are necessary to make the intangible assets ready for their intended use. Costs which cannot be included are advertising cost, administration cost or staff training cost or initial operating losses incurred from the operation. So if the purchase price is, for example, if purchase price is 10,000, tax on purchase is 500, it will be added. If a part of the tax is refundable, then it will be subtracted. 200 is a refundable tax. Expenses on purchase is 100, that will be added. Expenses on revolution is 100. The total recorded value will be 10,500. 10,000 plus 500 minus 200 plus 100 plus 100. Purchase price, if it includes any import duties and non-refundable purchase tax, will be, will, in, will be included with the purchase price. If there is any discount, that also will be subtracted, discounts and rebates. And directly attributable cost, attributable cost of preparing the assets for use like employee, it could impl in, include employee benefits, professional fees, cost of testing, etc. Et that is for intangible assets purchased separately. How to recognize them at cost. Let's look at an example to understand this. ABPLC, it acquires the copyrights to the original recording of a famous singer. So they purchase the copyrights of the original recordings of a famous singer. The agreement with the singer allows the company to record and record the singer for a period of five years. During the initial six months period of the agreement, the singer was very sick and consequently couldn't record any song. The studio time that was blocked by the company had to be paid even during the period the singer couldn't sing because the company hired a studio for recording the songs of that particular singer. The studio time was blocked 
and Karampani had to pay for the studio time, but the singer couldn't sing due to the sickness. So that was that money was paid. So the cost incurred by the company are legal cost of acquiring the copyrights was 10 million. Operational losses like studio time lost, etc., during the startup period was 2 million. And massive advertising campaign to launch the artist was 1 million. Which one of the preceding items is the cost that is eligible for capitalization as an intangible asset? Three costs are incurred were the legal cost of acquiring the copyrights, operational losses because studio time was lost, because the singer was sick and he couldn't sing for six months, two million of studio time payment for studio time was lost and massive advertising campaign was carried out by the company to launch the artist that was 1 million. Which one of the preceding items is the cost that is eligible for capitalization as an intangible asset? I want your response. I would like to have your response on this. Yes, waiting for your response. <coughs> Only the legal cost of acquiring the copyrights. Dibba Agarwal, thank you for the response. Only the legal cost of acquiring the copyrights. As we told in the earlier slide. Yes, thank you very much. Cost that cannot be included are advertising cost. Advertising, advertising cost expenditure incurred to launch the artist cannot be capitalized or that cannot be included. Similarly, initial operating losses incurred from an operation cannot be included. Advertising cost, administration cost or stock training cost or initial operating losses incurred from the operation, this cannot be included for the, for the purpose of capitalization of the intangible asset. So only cost that can be considered for capitalization is the legal cost of acquiring the copyrights. Thank you. See how you responded, Digbra, Hemant and Shahi from Mumbai Grant Road, Shahiraj. Now I will talk about the measurement of intangible assets. Initial measurement recognized at the cost. <coughs> measurement subsequent recognition. That means after, after. So initial means when you acquired the intangible assets afterwards in the next balance sheet date or, or on the next balance sheet, subsequent balance sheet dates, the subsequent measurement. Measurement subsequent recognition, there are again two models available here, just like PPE, same as IO16, cost model and the revaluation model. In property plant and equipment under IO16 we saw, there are two models for subsequent measurement, one is the cost model, the other is the revaluation model, same applies in case of IS38 also. Subsequent measurement can be done under the cost model. Company can <coughs> decide to use the cost model or they can revalue, use, revalue the asset from time to time and use the revaluation model. So IS38 is similar to IS16 with respect to initial measurement and also subsequent measurement. So cost model and revaluation models are available. We have already explained it under IS16. Now, how the useful life of an intangible asset should be measured? That is an important question. Like a property, plant and equipment, the useful life is decided. It's a management decision. It's a, it's a estimate is made of the useful life. So in the case of intangible assets, how the useful life should be determined? Because if it has to be, <coughs> because subsequent measurement based on cost model or on revelation model will need the useful life concept. Okay. So useful life of an intangible asset, some intangible assets can have finite life, some have infinite life. Finite life means the period of benefit to the entity will be for a limited period. The, the benefit to the entity will flow only for a limited period of time, then we call it a finite life. Finite and finite life is infinite life is not <coughs> indefinite life is not infinite life. Please understand. Indefinite life means no foreseeable limit to the period over which the asset is expected to generate cash inflow for the entity. It is not infinite life, indefinite life. 
So finite life or indefinite life? Finite life is there is a limited period of benefit to the entity, we call, then it is finite life. But if there is no foreseeable limit to the period over which the asset is expected to generate cash inflow or cost savings for the entity, then it is called indefinite life. The useful life of an intangible asset must be assessed on recognition as either indefinite or finite. If the assessment determines the life to be finite, then the length of the life or number of units to be produced must be determined also. An infinite useful life may be determined when there is no foreseeable limit to the period over which the entity will continue to receive the economic benefit from the asset. So all, benef all relevant factors must be considered in this assessment and may include expected usage by the entity and whether it could be used by the new management teams, product life cycles, rates of technical or commercial change, industry stability, likely actions by competitors, legal restrictions, or whether the useful life is dependent on the useful lives of other assets. If an intangible asset has a finite life, then it is presumed to have a reliably measure, measurable fair value. Indefinite doesn't mean infinite. Again, I am just re repeating this point. Indefinite doesn't mean infinite. It means only no foreseeable limit to the period over which the asset will is expected to generate benefit for the entity. Now we come to what is called impairment of intangible assets. What does impairment mean? We will talk about impairment. <coughs> there is a session on impairment under IS 36. We will talk more about impairment. But impairment basically means whenever an asset's carrying value in the books is less than its fair market value. Then we say the asset is impaired. You are carrying an asset in your books or in your books it at a certain value, but if the <coughs> fair market value of the asset at any point of time is less than the carrying value of the asset, then the asset is impaired and there is an impairment loss. <coughs> and that loss has to be provided for. So for impairment of intangible assets, which is impairment is covered under IS 36, provisions of relating to impairment are available under IS 36, which we will discuss separately. Entities have to apply the provisions of IS 36 impairment of assets in assessing the recoverable amount of intangible assets and when and how to determine whether the asset is impaired. The impairment test for different types of intangible assets are like this. For limited or finite life asset, recoverability test and then fair value test. Impairment tested with the recovery test, how much he can recover by selling the asset and then fair value test. Indefinite life other than goodwill, we have to apply the fair value test and for goodwill, it is the fair value test. So we will talk about this fair value test and recovery test afterwards in details. Now coming to research and development, internally generated assets internally generated intangible assets, so which are research and development expenses. So when an intangible asset is internally generated, there will be two stages. One is the research phase, the other is the development phase. So certain expenses will be incurred during the research phase and certain expenses will be incurred during development phase. Like say a pharmaceutical company developing a new drug. Every major pharmaceutical company, they are incurring, they usually incur heavy expenditures on research and development for finding new drugs, new medicines. So there are two phases. One is the research phase, the other is the development phase. <coughs> now research phase, these two phases can be distinguished. Sometimes it is not possible to distinguish the phases, but generally these two phases can be distinguished. Last slide. You want the last slide? Okay, I'll go back to the last slide. Just a minute, I am going back to the last slide because one of the participants want it. 
So tell me when you are finished, Jini Gupta from Sarita Bihar. So when you are done with this slide, please let me know. <coughs> then we will talk about internally generated intangible assets. Done? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> now, in, for internal, internal generated intangible assets, which are basically done through research and development, particularly like uh, a pharmaceutical company uh, trying to create new medicines, develop new medicines for certain illnesses. That, uh, is normally done. Most of the major pharmaceutical companies that are trying to develop newer medicines, more effective medicines and all that. So there can be two phases, research phase and the development phase. During the research phase, the expenditure which are incurred is normally written off as a revenue expenditure to profit and loss account. Development phase, whatever expenditures are incurred may be recognized as an intangible asset when the following conditions are met. Number one, it is technically feasible to complete the project. Second, an entity intends to complete the development of the asset and then use or sell it. Number three, the asset that is being developed is capable of being used or sold. Number four, future economic benefits can be generated for the entity itself. Number five, Resources are available to complete the development project. And number six, the development expenditure can be measured reliably. So if all these six conditions are met, then only the expenditure incurred during the development phase of an intangible asset can be capitalized as a <coughs> the cost of that internally generated intangible asset. So all the six conditions must be met. So in order to determine whether an internally generated intangible asset qualifies for recognition, its generation is divided into a research phase and development phase. If the two phases cannot be distinguished, then the entire expenditure is classified as research. If you are not able to distinguish the research and development phase, then the entire expenditure is classified as research and it will be expensed to the profit and loss account. It is treated as a revenue expenditure. Expenditure and research is to be written off as an expense as and when it is incurred it is, as it is not possible to demonstrate that an asset exists that will generate future economic benefit. During the research phase, whatever expenses incurred every year will be <coughs> treated as an expense to the profit and loss account. So it will be written off as an expense as and when incurred. Since it is not possible to demonstrate in the research phase that an asset exists that will generate future economic benefit. So research is basically defined as the original and planned investigation undertaken with the prospect of gaining new scientific or technical knowledge and understanding. So examples will include activities aimed at obtaining new knowledge, the search for evaluation and selection of application of research findings and knowledge, the search for alternatives for material devices, product system process. So this is the research phase. So any expenditure incurred during the research phase on internal generated intangible asset will be expensed to the profit and loss account as a revenue expenditure. In the year it is incurred. Only if it is possible to separate the research and the development phase to identify the research phase and development phase separate, separately, 
and the expenditure incurred during the development phase if it meets all the six criteria, then it can be capitalized. Then only it can be capitalized. If it is not possible to distinguish between the research phase and the development phase, that the entire expenditure will be considered to have been incurred as a research expenditure and it will be expensed to the profit and loss account, account as a revenue expenditure. <coughs> so let's look at an example to understand it. Yes, next class is Wednesday. No change in the next class. <coughs> this is for uh, the participant from Amritsar Mall. Name is not known to me. <coughs> so let's start on software development. Every PLC develops its own site for an internal, external access and usage. Can this be accounted as an intangible asset? Every PLC develops its own site for an internal, external access and usage. Can this be accounted as an intangible asset? So, many companies they develop their own website to be in accessed by internal users and external users. Can we, <coughs> it can be recognized as an internally generated intangible asset as per IS 38, provided it meets all the requirements relating to development. The six criteria for development to be recognized, development cost to be recognized, should, it should meet. Next question. Every PLC has a computer software that is essential to the operation of the computer hardware. Can this be accounted as an intangible asset? Second, it is a computer software that is essential to the operation of the computer hardware. Can this be accounted for as an intangible asset? <coughs> this we have already discussed now. Because it is essential for operation of the computer software, so it will be treated as a part of that hardware. So it will be basically treated under IS 16, SPP. Every PLC has a computer software that is a standalone package. Can this be accounted as an intangible asset? Again, again, the answer is yes. It is a standalone <coughs> package which is not required for operation of the hardware. It's a standalone package. So it can be accounted as an intangible asset under IS 38. <coughs> now, derecognition and subsequent expenditure, how it is to be recognized? First, we'll talk about derecognition. <coughs> An intangible asset will be recognized either on disposal, say that it applies for property, plant and equipment. So on disposal, when the intangible asset is sold, then it will be recognized, that means it will be removed from the financial statements or when no future economic benefits are expected. If no future benefits are expected from that intangible asset, it should be recognized. So gain or loss on disposal, Basically, net disposal profits minus carrying amount of the asset in the books. <coughs> so, that will be gain or loss. If the net disposal profits is more than the carrying amount, there is a gain. If the net disposal profits is less than the carrying amount, there will be loss. Okay. This is no different from what we discussed under IS 16. What about subsequent expenditure? There could be subsequent expenditure on an intangible asset. So after the purchase or completion of an intangible asset, there could be certain expenditure may be incurred afterwards. What to, how to treat that? The so subsequent expenditure on an intangible asset after its purchase or completion should be recognized as an expense when it is incurred. Normally, it should be recognized as an expense, even expenditure as and when it is incurred. Unless, exception will be it is probable that its expenditure will enable the asset to generate future economic benefits in excess of the originally assets standard of performance and the expenditure always can be measured and attributed to the asset reliability. Okay, again the last slide is written by somebody. So I'll go back to the last slide for a minute and then come back. Okay. So <coughs> Prashi Gupta tell me when you are finished. So 
Să te aceea sună zi, fii nici trec prin I hope you are finished. Done with the, the slide? Okay, thank you. The subsequent expenditure on an intangible asset after its purchase or completion, how it is to be treated? Normally it will be recognized as an expense, it should not be capitalized, it should be treated as a revenue expenditure as and when incurred, so it will be expensed to the profit and loss account. Unless It is probable that this expenditure will enable to the asset to generate future economic benefits in excess of its originally assessed standard of performance. And moreover, this expenditure can be measured and attributed to the asset reliability. If that condition is met, that means the exp subsequent expenditure incurred on an intangible asset <coughs> will generate future economic benefits in excess of the originally assessed standard of performance of that particular asset and moreover the expenditure incurred can be measured reliably and attributed to the asset. Then it can be capitalized. Only under that condition it can be capitalized, otherwise it will be treated as a revenue expenditure, it will be expensed to the profit and loss account. Now, Amortization and implement. Amortization is equivalent of what we call depreciation in the case of property, plant and equipment. That means you, instead of depreciating, you are basically amortizing. You are making an amortization charge so that the asset's value is recovered uh, over its life. Now, intangible, amortization only applies to intangible assets with finite lives. Amortization doesn't apply to intangible assets with indefinite. So, <coughs> intangible assets with finite lives can be amortized over the useful life annually, just like depreciation. Moreover, if you're amortizing it also, it has to be also tested for impairment when there is an indication, then the impairment loss also has to be charged. So, the depreciable amount of tangible assets with finite useful lives Intangible assets with finite useful life is to allocate it over the useful life. That, 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 that depreciation is called amortization actually. So that, that the depreciable amount is the cost of the asset <coughs> or the amount substituted for the cost in the revolution model less its residual value. Amortization shall commence when the asset is ready for use and shall cease when it is derecognized. So amortization will continue from the time when the asset is ready for use, intangible asset is ready for use, and it shall stop when it is recognized. But uh, intangible assets with indefinite lives, there is no amortization. They cannot be amortized. Because we do not know how long their useful life is. So no question of amortization. Only thing they will be, in, they'll be, in, they'll be, we look for their impairment. So every year, every year, the impairment test will be carried out. Whenever there is an indication that the intangible asset may be impaired, then impairment, to the extent of impairment, will loss or impairment loss has to be compensed. No amortization is allowed in case of intangible assets with indefinite lives. So they are not to be amortized, however, must be tested for impairment annually and wherever there is an indication, it, the impairment loss to be recognized or impairment loss must be accounted for. IS 36 which will be dealing subsequently provides guidance on impairment, so we will discuss impairment in more details. Additionally, the determination of an indefinite useful life must be reassessed at each challenge it made. Whether it has the asset as an indefinite useful life or not, this must be reassessed at each balance sheet date, if the assessment changes, supposing an asset which was earlier intangible assets which was earlier assessed as an, that having an infinite life, in subsequent reassessment it is found that it has a finite life, then we can start amortizing the asset. But this, if the assessment changes, it will be treated as a change in accounting estimates, so the amortization already will affect 
the current year's profit and loss and subsequent years. It will not affect the earlier years. So it will be applied prospectively because changes in accounting estimate only have prospective effect, no retrospective effect. Supposing there is an intangible error, I am just trying to give this example, try to elaborate this example. Supposing there is an intangible asset for which the initial assessment was that it has an indefinite life. So there is no amount, there is no amortization was being carried out. Maybe after five years of use, the management will be reassessing every year about the life useful life of the intangible asset and they come to a decision, yes, asset has another five years of useful life. So now it is a finite life. The asset is a indefinite life now as a finite life due to reassessment. Now, since it has a five, five more years of useful life left, so it has to be amortized over the next five years. So this is a change in the accounting estimate. So that it will affect only the next five years profit and loss because it has to be amortized. So amortization charges will be charged every year from now on and it will affect the current years profit and loss and the future years profit and loss. But it will not be applied retrospectively because it is a change in accounting estimate. It has a prospective effect only. Now positive purchase goodwill has to be, it's so a small quiz, <coughs> positive purchase goodwill, goodwill which is purchased, goodwill only can be recognized as an intangible asset provided it is purchased. Internally generated goodwill will not be recognized as an intangible asset that we have seen already. Positive purchase goodwill has to be amortized, tested for impairment annually, both. What is the correct answer? Shivam Sharma has come up with the answer, but that is not correct. Correct answer is tested for impairment annually because goodwill has an indefinite life, not amortized. Goodwill has an indefinite life. Goodwill doesn't have a finite life. So anything which has an indefinite life cannot be amortized. That's what the point I am taking. Intangible assets with indefinite lives, amortization is not allowed. So goodwill which has been purchased has an indefinite life, you cannot put a finite life for goodwill, so this cannot be amortized, so it should be only tested for impairment annually. So the answer, correct answer is B for the first one. Internally generated goodwill can be recognized, second question, and why? Yeah, answer is no, why? So Om Jindal, you have given the right answer. But why? Because its cost cannot be reliably measured. Simple reason. Internal generated goodwill, its cost can never be reliably measured. So that something whose cost cannot be reliably measured, we cannot recognize it. So internal generated goodwill of a company, its cost can never be reliably measured, so it cannot be recognized as a intangible asset. That is a simple answer. Now, key points on the goodwill under IFRS. So, we will talk a little more about goodwill. Key points on goodwill under IFRS. Goodwill is the excess value of the business. Only goodwill is recognized in case of business acquisition. So, goodwill is the excess value of the business taken as a whole over the fair value of its separate net assets. So, when I am purchasing a business, supposing company A purchases another company B, paying, let's say, 10 million. Company A purchases another business or another company B paying 10 million. Now if you look at the balance sheet of B as on the date of purchase, you will find there are certain assets. If you look at the fair value of these assets, there are certain assets and there could be some liabilities relating to the assets. So you look at the fair value of the net assets held by the company B. You find that the fair value of the net assets of the company B is 8 million as on the date of purchase. But company A paid 10 million to acquire the company B. So they paid 2 million extra over the fair value of the net assets. So that 2 million extra is basically the goodwill, cost of the goodwill purchase. So goodwill is the excess of value of business taken as a whole over the fair value of its separate net assets. 
So whenever I have business is taking my other business and paying a certain amount for taking over the other business, then we have to look at the fair value of the net assets of the business being taken over. The amount paid by the company to acquire the other business, the excess of the, the amount minus the fair value of the net assets is good. If the amount is less, it can also happen that the amount paid by the company for acquiring company A for acquiring company B is less than the fair value of the net assets. It can also happen sometimes. Then it's a negative goodwill. So positive purchase goodwill means the fair value, net asset means, supposing there is a, giving an example, supposing that company B which is being acquired has some property, some property, land and building etc. And they have also taken a loan against that property. Now the property value is 3 million, the loan against that property is so what is the net value of that asset? 2 million. So 2 million is the market value or fair value of the property owned by the company B. And 1 million is a loan taken by the company B against that property. For the sake of that property or whatever. So what is the net value of that asset? 3 minus 1, 2 million. So that is the concept of net asset. Is that clear Shivam? So goodwill is the excess of the value of the business taken as a whole over the fair value of its separate net assets. Goodwill is only recognized and recorded in case of purchase, that is business purchase. As I told you, internally generated goodwill can never be recognized because its cost cannot be reliably measured. Goodwill is only recognized and recorded in case of purchase, that is business purchase. So when one company buys another company, I, then in the company, in the company A which has bought B, company B, then the company A's balance sheet, they will recognize the goodwill as the excess of the value of the business B taken as a whole over the fair value of the net assets of the business B. Okay. So goodwill is only recognized and recorded in case of purchase, that is business purchase. Internally generated goodwill is not recognized since it is not identifiable, number one, it is not separable from the entity and its reliable measurement would not be possible. So goodwill is an intangible asset with indefinite life. That's why goodwill cannot be amortized. It can be only tested for impairment annually. So goodwill is an intangible asset with indefinite life, hence it is not amortized annually. However, it is tested for impairment on every reporting date, every balance before every balance sheet date or in every reporting date, it will be tested for impairment. And if there is a... <coughs> Loss, impairment loss, that should be recognized. So we'll now talk about the difference between the IFRS and US gap so far as intangible assets accounting is concerned. The ideas are basically for internally generated intangible assets. Under IFRS IS 38, costs in the research phase are always expensed. Costs in the development phase are capitalized if the six specific criteria which we discussed are met. Okay. Under US GAAP ASC 350, US GAAP prohibits the recognition of internally generated cost, <laughs> internally generated goodwill without with limited exceptions. So uh, US GAAP doesn't allow recognition of internally generated goodwill, but there are some exceptions. Some limited exceptions are available. Thus generally both research and development costs are expensed as incurred. There are special guidance notes for the treatment of cost as to the development of software for sale to third parties and separate guidance on software for internal use. So you will get very special guidance for treatment of cost as to the development of software which have to be sold to third parties and separate guidance on software for the inter internal use of the developer. Second idea is R&D intangible assets on acquisition. Asset acquisition or business combination. <coughs> so, research and development intangible assets which are acquired. Assets acquisition or business acquisition. Under IFRS IS 38, capitalization of this cost is done only if it is probable that future economic benefits will be derived. So, then capitalization can be done. Under US GAAP ASC 350, capitalization depends on the type of acquisition and alternative future use of the asset acquired. 
So these are the areas of difference between IFRS and US GAAP so far as intangible assets are concerned. So I will request you to complete your feedback now. Okay, thank you for completing your feedback. So, we'll close the session today. If you have any question, you can ask it, otherwise, I'll close the session today. <laughs> Please, any questions you have got, you have time to ask. Still, there is time. by mistake. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, any questions please? We have time to ask questions if you want. If anything is not clear, I invite you to ask questions to clear your doubts. Okay. Something coming from Vibha. Goodwill, if it is purchased, then it is it as an intangible asset. Goodwill, as I told you, internally generated goodwill cannot be recognized as an intangible asset. Goodwill is normally an intangible asset. Only thing, when a business acquires another business, then the excess of the consideration paid for acquiring the other business over the value, net assets of its, net, net asset value is called goodwill. That will be treated as a intangible assets in the books of the company which acquired the other company. So that's why I'll give you an example, company A acquires company B paying 10 millions. Company A acquired company B paying 10 millions. Now if the net asset value, fair value of the net assets of company B is 8 million, then company A has paid extra 2 million. For what? That is for the goodwill of the company B. So that goodwill, that 2 million will be showed as a purchase goodwill. That is the goodwill that will be reflected in the company's egg books now will be 2 million. That will be an intangible asset which has an indefinite life, number one. Being, having indefinite life, it cannot be amortized because any intangible asset with indefinite life cannot be amortized. 
So only thing has to be done, you have to test it for impairment annually and if there is an impairment loss, then that impairment loss has to be accounted for. So when you talk about impairment in one next session, we will be talking about impairment, things will be discussed in more details. But basically goodwill is an intangible, intangible asset provided it is an acquired or purchased goodwill. Internally generated goodwill, uh, although it meets the other, def um, it meets some of the definition of the intangible asset because number one, it is not separable from the entity, number one, and number two, it cannot, its cost cannot be identified reliably, that's why it is not treated as an, not recognized as an intangible asset. Although a company may have goodwill, but it cannot be internally generated goodwill, that cannot be accounted for or recognized as an intangible asset. But purchase goodwill, yes. Purchase goodwill will be shown as an intangible asset. So I hope I have cleared your doubts. Any other question, you can ask. <coughs> okay, so we'll close the session today. We'll be meeting on Wednesday again.